My name's Eric and I'm an alcoholic. And uh, I don't know how to do this at all, really. Plus the fact that, I mean, uh, I've only just started being able to speak again because about three weeks ago I had all my teeth taken out and, uh, and these implants put in. And um, so it all kind of feels funny in there. And I'm, you know, I'm, just, I'm just trying to kind of overcome this lisp and a whistle, which you can hear. <laughs> So, um, and actually, uh, some of it is quite nice because I sound like people I used to admire, like Otis Rush and Ray Charles, who used to sing with a lip. So that's cool. But one of the great things about this was that one of the, my dreads as a, a practicing alcoholic was dentistry. Um, it was like a, a lot of other things that, w that, that were really just not uh, not available to me. I had such a, a you know, the dysfunctionality in my life was so pronounced that I didn't even see a toothbrush until I was about 18. You know, I was I, very poor stuff, all that raised with, you know, in a two up, two down, where there was an outside you know, zinc bath and no bathroom. And so, but I remember being in class at school about uh, 10 years old and the back of one of my front teeth fell off. I mean, and, and that's where a lot of my kind of disease started to kick in because I started lying. And uh, I think I'd already kind of developed the, that hot, the thing that, you know, Lauren and other people have talked about, that thing about changing the way I felt. I started changing the way I felt right then and then, obviously before because um, my teeth fell off because of sugar. And I started eating sugar. Um, I mean, I can't even remember when I was probably five years old. Sugar on bread and butter. And that was like, a, I don't know, it was like a post-war thing in England. That that's what you did. Poor families did that. Um, they used to put sugar in milk to feed the children so that the children would, would drink the milk. And it was, it was like it was part of bad education, uh, all kinds of uh, just dysfunctionality. And, um, and so I was kind of set up. I was ready for this stuff. And, I, and, I, and I, you know, there were so many other ways that it was coming into my life. I lived in a village in the country in England where we had this thing called the British Legion, which was like a veterans society, you know, and, um, and I would see the ground. We would, as kids, would be taken and we'd be stuck outside, put outside with a packet of um, crisps or whatever you call them here, potato chips and, and a Coke or something, and they would go inside and they would change, you know, the adults would change, and they'd go in kind of quiet and reserved and miserable. And I, you'd hear them changing inside <laughs> into, into kind of happy, uh, uninhibited, uh, you know, gregarious people. And they'd, be, and they'd be having the time of their lives. And then they'd come out and then they'd be, you know, once they were kind of out again and they'd take a sign, there would be a shift back somehow. And it would be a little bit more pronounced. It'd be a bit more kind of um, aggressive and sullen. Uh, and, you know, it was kind of like, that was like a little microcosm of what my kind of drinking was like, that I would be, you know, just shy, withdrawn, terrified, fear-based human being who, who once I got something inside of me became, you know, anybody and was up for anything. And then as it started to wear off, I became malevolent and violent and aggressive and, and miserable and, and in the end suicidal. And... Uh, and that, that's what brought me here. And, and I, you know, the one thing that you always, you know, that I go over and over in, in my head, and whenever I think about what I'm going to say at a meeting is that apart from uh, being blessed, you know, I wonder why I was chosen for this and why we get to be chosen. I mean, I wouldn't even think about how that affects you, what you think about that. But I know for me, I don't understand why some people don't want this. I mean, I've brought... I've, I've done some 12-step work where I've brought people to the door and I've seen them turn away, walk away. And I've seen others die, you know, deliberately die when confronted with the whole notion of getting honest and, uh, and looking at their past and trying to uh, do the work that, 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 that is involved. And, um, and, I, and I don't understand why they didn't want to do it, you know, and, I, and why me, why you, why we get to be fortunate enough to, to the miracle I'm talking about is the wanting. That's the miracle in my life, is that I wanted this. 
um, enough to do the hard work. And, I, you know, I found it painful. I'm sure we've all found it painful. I'm sure the newcomers find it very, very painful. And I can't even remember. I mean, that seems like a fog, like there's a fog between me now and where I'm because I know I was just driven by fear. And like, I remember coming to meetings, trying to impress everybody with the fact that I'd been around for a while. So, you know, how, do you, how does a newcomer do that? You know, I wanted everyone, it was impossible. I wanted to pretend like I'd done the steps. I wanted to pretend like I was, you know, three or four years sober when I was only six weeks. And, it, and, and that, the pain of that, you know, the pain of that self-consciousness of, um, the pain of asking for help, that to me was very, very hard work. I don't know anybody um, who seriously works on this program who finds it easy because it's not supposed to be, because it requires that we, that we put one foot in front of the other. And, we, and, and the most courageous people in the world, in my book, are recovering alcoholics, the people that walk through that door. And on a day, and that's still the same for me now, you know, driving up here tonight. I, if I was, I have to hand it over. I have to hand it over to to my higher power because, and I, and that's easy for me now. I just say, you know, I don't know what to do. Get me there. I mean, I pray about like each mile of the road. I'm driving. Get me there safe. Get me something to eat. You know, <laughs> let the people be nice to me. Let and and then, and then don't let do, and try to keep me from talking about what I think. You know. <laughs> Because that was a complete waste of time, and it, and, it, and, it, and they all know, you know, they all, we are, you know, it's like we're all kind of experts on one fucking thing or another. But <clears throat> so, and, and you know, and I just hope that he, you know, sometimes he, he, well, he answers most of my, but he got me here. It's like I think it was Ted said that, you know, that whole thing about. Uh, you know, I'm paying back because I, I prayed all through my drinking to be got out of every situation I was in, you know, to be relieved of this, to be got through that, and I'll never do it again, and, uh, and I'd do it again, and I'd ask, and I was always delivered. Now, and that's the other thing is, why was I, uh, and so I, I, and the thing is, you know, it really is none of my business. That's the, that's the, the kind of the, the kernel of it all, is that. I'm not supposed to, I don't think I'm supposed to know. And whether I think I'm supposed to know or not doesn't make any difference because I'm not going to ever find out. You know, I don't think I will. Uh, it's only when I look back on the path that I've already traveled that I see how when I've been there meeting that person, there's been some kind of connection where they meet another person that somehow brought to you know, the program or something. And then I see that every girlfriend I've ever had or every you know, tr journey I've ever taken has been in order for me to do some, it's all about service. And the thing is that I can't govern that. I have no control over it. And really all I've got to remember to do is just show up. Uh, and, the th and, and the rest is done for me. Uh, because I don't, you know, the minute I try to figure out how this works, I don't need to come here anymore. And that's, and that's a frightening thought. And because I know people that do, and I guess, they, some, I know some that do, and it's like, oh, well, I'm getting off on a tangent, and they turn into lecturers, and they turn into experts, and, and I'm not, that's not what I want. I, li I like to hear people that are, you know, around a long time who still say, like, I don't know how to do this, you know, I don't know what, I'm frightened, or, because then I know that they're human, and I can, be, uh, you know, because I, it's like I go back to that thing of authority, I can't be around authority, I, I need humility, I need humility as an example. I need to see that someone could stay sober a long time and not become authoritative, not become, you know, like a governing body, not become an expert, that they can be, they can retain their innocence, that they can be childlike and still be adults, you know. And, and that's, that's what, I find that here. I don't find it anywhere else. And I, thought, I know there are great people out there without programs who just seem to be on the path. And I do meet them from time to time. But if I want to be guaranteed to that kind of exposure, I come to an AA meeting, and I get it here. And uh, so, I, I mean, my story is very, very simple. I just, you know, it's, I'm, I'm just the same as everybody else here. It got hairy. It, uh, um, it got good. I crossed the line. It got nasty. And somewhere, <laughs> you know, 
and I don't, you know, with that whole thing about, I knew for a very, very, very long time that I'd crossed that line. I don't remember crossing it, but I knew for at least the last 10 years of my drinking, I think, that I had to stop. And I would, rem I remember getting, waking up, coming to, and, and thinking, well, today is the day. I've got to stop this today. And I can't, t I can't, I can't, I don't want to tell anybody about that because I don't want to make any promises to anyone. <laughs> so this is something I want to do on my own. And then when I've done it, I can say. And, uh, but I'll just have a drink first to kind of like get the, <laughs> so that my mind can function, you know, so that I can figure out how to, how I'm going to do it. And I, of course, the first one wouldn't even go down. It would just be reject. My body would reject it, and I'd be dry heaving, and then it would be like, and it was vodka, you know, it was all, of course, in the end, I'm sure most of us know that one. And, uh, and finally, the third or fourth one would go down, and then, the sh then I'd go, I'd be fine. And, and I'd think, right, now, so what should I, how would I go about this? Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll take the bottle down to the other room, and I'd move around the house, you know. <laughs> Um, postponing, postponing the actual whatever it was I thought I was going to do, postponing it until the bottle was empty, and I was passed out again. And uh, and, it was, and and you know while I was doing that, I was thinking, well, this afternoon, this afternoon I'll stop, you know. And of course, this afternoon was gone, you know. And, I, and I'd wake up, and it would be dark, and I wouldn't know whether that darkness was morning or evening. I mean, I didn't know. I'd be at home, and I didn't know where I was, you know. I was. Um, and, and I was married, I had a, a very successful career, and I, this has been a great thing for me in my uh, journey, was being able to tell people um, that acquisition is not it, um, because by the time I was 23, I was a millionaire with the gift that God gave me as a musician. I was making money without wanting to make money. I didn't, I didn't know how to stop it coming in, and I tried very hard, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> and I would leave every band. The minute they thought they wanted to be on TV, I was gone. You know? <laughs> there was some. I actually would see the anon the anonymous part of the program was very familiar because somehow or another I wanted that for me anyway. I wanted to be able to be good at something, but without anybody knowing it. But I did want them to know at the same. It was like that whole paradox of I don't want you to know, but I want the kudos. And I had the madness, insanity even then. So. But um, the whole thing about that was that I didn't want to be rich. I didn't want to be successful. And, and, and as long as I had that going on, I could not stop it. And, and I'm sure it's, you know, people that want money, want success, it just doesn't happen because there's something, there's like a paradox in there. Um, but I do know that having all that stuff, and having a beautiful wife and a great home and a career that just shone, you know, no matter what I tried to do to destruct the whole thing, it kept getting better and better. And uh, <laughs> in spite of all that, at the end of each day, I was considering suicide. And uh, now, see, that, how does that make sense? You know, that, and, I, and I know that there are people um, who probably come into this program without very much who think that this is going to get them that, you know, and, and maybe it will. But, uh, but for sure, along with it come a lot of other problems, and, and some of those things I don't know if I'm ready for now. I mean, I'm still quite, you know, self-destruct. I mean, I do like to uh, sabotage, self-sabotage a lot, and I still practice that. I still kind of set about trying to undermine it, so that, so that I'm basically, so that I can survive, really, and, and retain some kind of anonymity. Um, so for that part of me, um, there, I'm very lucky and blessed in that I did, for instance, have a fairly strong belief in God when I came here. That was not a problem for me. And I did want to be anonymous. So when people uh, came up to me at, at meetings and asked for my autograph, it was easy for me to say, no, you know, I'm, I'm Eric the alcoholic. Um, and there was a time, I think, where there was definite conflict in it for me that when I first got sober, which is a long while ago now, it was back in 80, 1981, um, I went out on the road. You know, I went out on tour 
and it sounded like shit, and I felt, and it was an awful experience, and of course it was every, you know, I was in treatment, and everyone said, counselors and fellow patients alike said, you know, um, don't do anything, it's like that old thing, don't do anything, don't get involved with anybody, don't make any decisions, don't do anything for a year, and within six months I was touring America on a massive scale, <laughs> hating every minute of it, and, uh, and being, being around, um, very, very dangerous situations all the time. And, not, and really kind of feeling miserable. And I suppose, you know, I was, you know, I was on the way back. And I, and I relapsed as a result of that. And, and in my, I went back into treatment. And in that period of time, um, being back in treatment, you know, I had to confront. I was either going to come back here as an alcoholic above all, uh, or I, I was probably going to die, you know, and this was, I mean, I had it, I have it in spades, this disease, I really do, I have it on every level, I mean, I, I'm, I, I project all the time, I'm a fear-based guy, um, that, you know, shame, I go into shame spirals at the drop of that, I'm getting better, like, like Lauren said, I'm improving, but I don't do anything. I mean, all I do is I, I come to meetings and I, and, I, and I pray that God will do most of the rest. I, will try, I work the steps, but I'm very conscious of the fact that my, my defects are not really mine to control. I mean, I can't, I've never been able to, like someone else said, I don't know how to hand it over. I still don't know quite how to hand it over other than to try and help somebody else. You know, when, when I get into that predicament about self-obsession, I kind of got a... a a switch where I think, well, think, think about somebody else. Go and do something for somebody else. That's my way of handing it over. But I don't know if that's the right. I mean, it's the way I do it. But for me, it's still, it's tough, you know. And uh, the thing about where I've had to work very hard is being, you know, having this kind of celebrity as a musician and being, like, on the media. Uh, and, you know, and, uh, and there's recently been a thing where I tried to, I've, I've put together a, a center in the Caribbean to to help people, and I and I realize that that's not an AA project. You know, I've had to kind of really work hard on my boundaries around this stuff. Is that you know, treatment centers are not AA. You know, that's like they 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 work with the twelve step program and they advise, but nevertheless, you know, I've, and, and it's still a separate issue. And when I was Confronted with these people that, you know, that I put together to make this thing work, they said, well, you're going to go out there and have to go out there. And you're our only asset. Nobody knows this fucking thing is here. You've got to go and tell them that it's here. And you've got to, and in order, you know, in order to do that, well, I said, well, what am I going to do? I go on 60 Minutes, do the, the Today Show. I do, like, all kinds of fucking magazine and newspaper articles. And in the course of that, I'm on the edge the whole time of breaking my anonymity. And that's been a real tough thing. And, you know, that's given me, that whole exercise gave me a great a learning curve about what, my, how important my anonymity is to me. And it is really about my boundary, about, you know, how much I, because now I've got to the point where I love this thing we have. I love it above all. And even when I say that, I can feel a tingle coming to me because it's a spiritual thing for me that, that, that what we do and the way we help other people and ourselves in, in the process is not to be fucked with. It is not to be compromised. <laughs> yeah. And I've been, you know, and, and it's like, it's amazing how, how when, when people are faced with that, how it tantalizes people. You know, like, uh, I remember my sponsor being involved in the kind of sort of business project where, you know, they had a long conference with these other people that he was involved with on some business thing, and it was all folding, it was getting crazy, and somehow or another, he sorted it all out, and after the meeting, one of these guys came up to him and said, you know, I don't know, what, I don't know how you did that, and it was brilliant, but what, what's your secret? What, what, what have you got in, going on? And he said, well, um, it, it's nothing to do with me, and it is a secret, you know, and that was like, uh, that's what it, <laughs> and, and I love that, you know, that, that and, and that guy, you know, he's, he's got 20 years, and he is like a, a saint to me, but he's one of those guys that says, I don't know, I don't know, I mean, I just go to meetings, you know, and I love that, but, 
but it is very difficult. I've had to do a lot of work going up, going to, to talk to people in treatment centers, saying like, you know, the, that primary purpose, you know, where they, when we read the preamble, our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. That is my primary purpose. And I've had to be, you know, like, my primary purpose is not making sure this fucking treatment center works. My primary purpose is if I get the opportunity going in there and telling the alcoholics in there, the recovering people that want to stay sober, my story, not what I think, or not, you know, please get your other pals to come in because we need the money, you know, but seriously, just to be there so that they can see that I'm a guy with a load of money who's had a great career, but who still occasionally thinks about suicide and, you know, although that got a lot better, I can assure you. But but that that is not it. That it is about peace of mind, which comes from other other people, comes from our common welfare. Um, and that's what I always rely on. You know, that um in any given difficult situation, there's two options for me. One is to isolate and try and figure it out and eventually fucking self destruct and go down the road that I've already travelled. The other one is to come here and ask you for what you did when you had the similar experience. And that's the one I've chosen most. And it works. And it, and it is usually, you know, I'll avoid people that try and, you know, proselytize or, or, or lecture or tell me what they think. I will say, well, tell me what you did when this happened to you so that I get the experience. Uh, and just, and usually it is the simplest thing imaginable, you know. And that's what works. And uh, so that's it for me. I mean, I flew all this way to come to this meeting, and uh, <laughs> uh, and, I, and I'm really, really, I'm really glad to be here. Um, I, I had no idea. I, I remember actually driving up the coast, thinking that about 20 years ago, I came up here to make a record at a place called Shangri-La. And man, I, is, it, is it different now? I mean, am I, I don't know if it's still there, the place. But some of those guys are dead, you know. Um, one of them's in, and this was a group called The Band, you know, that was a great band. And one of them hung himself, and he was like, we were, we drank together. I mean, he was like a Grand Marniac freak. He drank Grand Marniac at the bottle, and I love, man, that, that's a man's way of drinking, you know. <laughs> um, and he hung himself. And I thought, and I've seen so many people, lost so many friends who, didn't get this light shone in their lives, and which brings me back to that thing is like God, uh, God somehow or another chose us, and now we get to choose, and and that's the other thing about this program that I love the most is that I have a choice today, and like Lauren also said, I can look back and see that it's all been choice, and it still is, you know, I can choose, and and I am responsible for my own happiness, and and for my my own life. I'm totally responsible today. I don't blame anymore. I try to still on occasion because I am an alcoholic and, and I will always, I will always, always act in that typical way. My first response is usually to, you know, fuck it, it's his fault or her fault. And then I modify and, and that's, and then I act. I act usually on the modification. And uh, for that, I'm really grateful. Um, it's been almost 12 years for me, and, and, and I guess I've got another 12 to go before I'll have paid back my debt, and, uh, uh, and I hope a bit more, you know. Um, I don't ever really think about this as being a long, long road. It's still one day at a time for me. I really don't make too many plans. I, I try to take the program to everything I do. The way, I, the way I love, the way I, I live, the way I work. It's about spontaneity and being in the moment. And we're very, very lucky to be given this gift. And, uh, and I'm very grateful for you listening to me tonight. Thanks. Thanks for letting me share.